What are we drinking tonight? Tonight, we are imbibing a Coca-Cola of the North American variety, specifically Mexican. We have foregone the high fructose corn syrup in favor of cane sugar, or as my rapper compadres would call it, that pure pure. It's a little anti-American, but I'll accept it. I think it was very specific in my continents. Flavor before country. I get it. <laughs> That's a t-shirt. Oh, maybe when uh, Soda Score rolls out globally, that'll be our campaign slogan. Let's go ahead and get the plug out. Soda Score is is what is it? A website? Is it is it a social network? What do you? How would you describe it? I would describe it as a way of life. Is it is it in? Beta, do I have to access it just because I know you? Or can anybody go to like sodascore.com and make an account and keep track of the, the sodas that they drink and rate them? Uh, they wouldn't at sodascore.com, but they would at sodascore.app. Gotcha. Sodascore.app. Yeah. Uh, as far as beta goes... You are now sort of in forever beta in that you have a version of the app that is ahead of what will be released in the app store. I deserve it. Yeah, you earned that. I like uh, the, the many tax benefits and opportunities that come with you buying advertising for your own podcast that apparently has two listeners. <laughs> Three now. Oh, okay. It's very similar to Hollywood math and Hollywood accounting. You can cut this out as well, but here's an interesting story from some friends of mine. Uh, used to be on a record label that would buy full-page advertisements in magazines to promote a new band or a new record or something like that. And in the bottom of those full-page advertisements... They would put little also available from this record label and they'd put little album covers or sometimes even just text. Yeah, I'm nodding my head. And they would split the cost of that evenly across all of those artists. You would pretty much never recoup because your album was always getting marketing dollars attributed to it because you were getting this also available from this record label. Yeah, I think it I think it was the the screenwriter for Men in Black just just only like maybe last year or so was talking about how uh, Men in Black according to the studio's accounting still hasn't turned a profit four sequels and <laughs> a theme park ride later still still can't find a way all those, all those viewings on TBS, and it just can't figure out how to get to the black. So the Home Alone minute, specifically minute 14, the one that goes from 13 to 14. Thank you for clarifying. In summary, what would you say happens during that minute? I would say Christmas magic, but I think you would say something else. I would say John Hughes magic. Okay. Fair. One of the same, maybe. Yeah. Although I think Chris Columbus would like to take credit for the for being the king of Christmas, I think. It really is John Williams shining in this minute, but So for everyone who's not following along and just wants to hear what this minute is about, this minute has minimal dialogue because it's a lot of establishing shots as well as I think what you already said best, which is some magic happening. In the previous minute, Kevin wished that his family would just disappear. And then we cut to the moon and night falls on the McAllister home and strange things are a bruin. Bows are breaking. Wind is rustling. And the, the last piece that we needed to leave Kevin home alone happens and the, the power goes out. Makes them late. They forget about Kevin. 
You've seen it. Wish wish fulfilled. I do appreciate you calling out the bow breaking because they did go against the grain. Not a single cradle fell. <laughs> no. I think I think we've discussed this privately off podcast in the past, but I really do think that this minute speaks to supernatural forces at play. Yes. I think it absolutely okay. does. It's the spirit of Christmas swooping in to give Kevin what he asked for. There's no other way to explain these weird shots of the Santa wreath on their front door. I wanted to point out something else that's a bit more practical about how a lot is happening in this minute. From us cutting away from Kevin and then us cutting back into the house, how many shots do you think there are between those points? Ooh, how many shots? Let's see. So I'll, if I can, if I can so if I, if I give you the first one being the moon with the clouds sort of passing in front, and if I say yep. the last one is us going back inside the house to see the clock on the bedside table go out due to the power outage. Right. So if that's the last mm-hmm. shot, what number is that? Right. If the moon is one, okay. What number is the clock going out? Oh man! And this is a nice little breakdown too. We maybe we can talk. Maybe about we can them, just yeah, we can just talk through them. So first one is the moon. If, if, if first one's moon, I believe the next one is they they cut to sort of like a, a wider shot of the front yard. Or am I wrong? No, you're already, already right. right. You're already right uh, in the way that I knew you would be. And something that's in the script that I didn't even notice until I saw it in the script is that there actually is a like a plastic Santa blowing across the front yard. This is like your first catch of that yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I try to be conscious of the things that I uh, notice for the first time on these rewatches. And there's something later that I'll talk about. Okay. Uh, which is, I caught for the first time on this watch, but that one I had picked up just because like they've, they've done Foley for that. So you kind of see it and hear it yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I, just, I just picked up on it for the first time. And then, so that shot too, we'll call that rolling Santa. And then we've got like just wind blowing through trees. Is that right? Uh, So after that, we stay within that same sort of frame of reference, but we have a new shot that's much, much closer. Do we go to the door there? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So I'm already, I'm already way off. Um, Let me play your game of, of, of guessing the number of shots. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are eight shots before we get back to the alarm clock. So you're saying alarm clock is nine. Yeah. So exclusive of clock, eight shots. Yeah. That's my guess. So exclusive of clock, it is 11 shots. Okay. Like I say, that's why I'm, I'm trying to balance out our magic with practical because yes a lot of unsung heroes here a lot of people set up a bunch of shots for just seconds of things that even someone such as yourself in this particular situation even being somewhat generous said eight shots we're breaking down for me. we've got we've got santa rolling across the yard what do we got to after so that's rolling santa that's number two uh (laughs) so shot number three is the ribbon being torn from the lamp post? Oh yeah, yeah, the bow blowing off. Right. Yes. Um, and like I say, that these are practical effects. And like when I think about rolling Santa, depending on how specific they wanted that to be, they could have done a few takes of that. They also, it's pretty easy to just sort of keep rolling the other kind of rolling. So two things rolling: Santa and camera. <laughs> Uh, but again, just some appreciation for the folks who are doing all that. So actually, you know, Jared, I don't know if you know this, but, um, I watched that Netflix special and actually what they did is they, um, covered the back of that bow in glue and threw it at the lamppost and then ran the film backwards. (laughs) They threw Fuller at the chair. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So lamppost, uh, Bow, bow flies off, which tells us 
win. <laughs> the whole film was actually uh, a little boy who lived alone getting a family, and then they just ran it in reverse. Yeah. Uh, so, ribbon, bow, being pulled from lamppost is shot three. Shot four is the shot where I uh, noticed something for the first time. Uh, so, shot four is the windows. Okay. Um, the, the shutters. Uh, okay, as I think yes, the, yes. the sort of vibration we're supposed to be feeling. Rolling Santa, blowing bow. Flap and shutters. And flap and shutters is the thing that I had noticed on, I don't know, 700th watch here. Uh, I didn't realize that their shutters had cutouts in them. Ooh. Their shutters are not flat or even like... They're like a decorative uh, cutout kind of deal? Yeah. So I thought that was kind of interesting because it's not hidden or even... All that small a detail. It's just that I'd never noticed it before. Yeah, they got like a little, like a like a little hole in them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's shot four. Uh, shot five is us over the door, the front door. This is the weirdest two shots in a row in the whole movie, in my opinion. We go high angle on their front door. But I think it's so that you can get the ex- you can get the extreme motion of the wreath, but also the even more extreme motion of the front porch light. Yeah, because you see it because that's kind of dangling. It's too. just swinging violently. It's another dangling, <laughs> not the last dangly one we'll see in this movie. But we wait, 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 wait. From- Is that foreshadowing? <laughs> Um, there is plenty of shadowing in this, in this too. There are lots of light, uh, bouncing off of darkness and stuff. Right. But to, to your go point, that high angle, that high angle wreath shot to the same, shooting the same thing, but low angle. And then to creepily zoom in on that Santa. I wouldn't say creepy as much as ominous. It's an ominous move in. It's a on that Santa. It's a speedy zoom. I'd say it's a quick zoom. Scary looking Santa. It is. This whole this minute's got a weird tone to it. Well, I think by design, right? That's to tell you it's not just an establishing shot saying, "Hey, the weather's rough." No, no, no. We have tricky Santa here. Yes. We have supernatural forces at play. There's a reason why Santa is an anagram of Antas. Antas. Shot number seven is just panning against a sky with sort of a tree silhouette. It's a bit too blue to be a Halloween shot, but you could use it for that. The eighth shot is a very close shot of the bow breaking. Yeah. Do you think that there's just a a guy on the end of that stick just pulling on it? Absolutely. And I but don't it think it's the first one either, which is why it's so close. I think they had to pick out the right kind of stick that it wouldn't bend so much. Like it's it looks straight until you know what they did actually do is they uh, put a lot of glue on that broken branch and put it back in place and then ran it backwards. I was hoping it would be like a Christopher Nolan thing where they like planted a bunch of trees that were bred specifically to break. Yeah, yeah, he cross-pollinated it with a very fragile species of tree. Very, very brittle, but uh, straight stick. Just planted. Had to get it done. Yeah, just planted a, an acre of dogwood. Yeah, this is the last shot. It was done five years after the rest <laughs> of principal photography. So that's shot eight. Okay. In order for us. That's to, an important shot. It is. It would be incredibly important if it weren't usurped by shot nine, which is the limb actually falling onto the power lines, which I think if we were to remove shot eight, we would gather had happened based on shot nine. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It is a little weird. We have to establish tree. Branch breaks. Branch falls on power lines. Like... 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is funny because nine shot nine is is fairly busy in that it has a little sort of Rube Goldberg to it because you have the limb hitting the power lines and then the transformer kind of sparking and blowing up. We have another additional shot. Shot number 10 is a tighter shot on that transformer sparking and blowing up. Shot 11 is the sparks from said transformer falling into the street. We sort of see the remnants of what has been above. So it, it, it actually is the first time we get some really good perspective of where we actually are in this. Cause a lot of this is very much up in the tree line and we don't really get a sense for where this is happening. We see the sparks fall in the street. We see that shot. And I will say about this shot, shot number 11, where the sparks are falling in the street, it's possible that this is the same as shot number two, Rolling Santa, because it is that same sort of distant shot of the front of the house. Yeah, it's almost from the other side of the street almost. like there's- Yes, it absolutely is, because the other side of the street is where the power lines and all of that are being affected. So it's possible that this shot was done in the same setup as two, uh, but it it certainly is a at least a planned other shot because it's the shot where we see all of the lights in the house go out. Yeah, that's that's important. And then shot number twelve is the clock going out. Yeah, surrounded by some great prop work. <laughs> yeah, it's a very it's a very lived in uh, bedside table. Yeah. Happy Holidays mug and all of that. Just a quick little Homer Simpson trivia here. Do you know the brand of the alarm clock? Ooh, no, I don't. Panasonic. Okay, okay. Do you know what time it was when the power was? Ooh. I want to say it was like three something. Ooh, I think it's four something. It was like 347 or something like that. 437. Ah, blast this dyslexia. And then uh, after that, it cuts to the morning, right? We go back outside, like immediately? It does. Uh, Well, kind of. It cuts to us as the viewer being inside the home. It cuts to us? Yeah. Oh, yes. We're inside the home looking out and seeing someone knock on the door. The great visual gag of of picking up the, the statue again. Right. So then we do cut outside after seeing... Seeing someone knock on the door, we cut actually outside. That statue gag is so corny, but just plays perfectly. Like anything else that would be in the same vein as that, I would just groan at. But I just love it. Yeah, it's really good. And the fact that we don't see them... (laughs) <laughs> that we don't, knock it over. Right. We don't we just see the aftermath. We've seen we've seen why he's picking. Maybe it maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just so well executed. Yeah. This is Chicago's iciest driveway. <laughs> On tonight's episode of Chicago's Iciest Driveways. <laughs> 671 Lincoln Boulevard. I also noticed that we didn't get a 555 number on the airport on the shuttle. Airport shuttle. Yeah. yeah. And uh I'm wondering if Airport Express actually has that number live. Do you think they still have it? Something about those airport adjacent companies. I just feel like they've been in business forever. Yeah. Well, like once you figure out what you're doing, we'll let some internet sleuths sort that out. There's a company called Delaware Express. They've been driven by excellence since 1984. See, that's what I'm saying. 84. No startups here. But they're they're not Chicago based though. They offer uh, single day trips to into New York City, Washington D.C., New Jersey. But well, you can call them at four five four seven eight hundred. I love the subplot that Airport Express got so big that they had to be broken <laughs> up, and that the <laughs> northeastern. <laughs> section of the monopoly that had been broken up yeah the feds let the the delaware express keep the phone number 
They were just too big. Uh, hey, how many how many volts is on that transformer? Five thousand. All, all five thousand. I don't know if that's a lot or not enough or a completely arbitrary number. It it looks like the fakest sticker in the world. <laughs> it, it's not. It's not like danger. Five thousand volts. It's just like hey, five thousand volts, as if you're buying the panel from someone and you're just like going down the aisle like how many volts do you need for this one yeah i don't know if that's a lot or not like just tell me it's high high voltage danger i don't know i mean don't i do like that 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 guy who had like you know that one line he also got to do some up there in the in the cherry picker kind of like right craft work right he hasn't had uh he hasn't had his line yet, but we do see him practicing his trade. This has got to be a guy who Chris Columbus or John Hughes or somebody is just, just trying to help out because he's got a long enough line to get him into SAG. He's up there on the, you know, on, on the cherry picker thing. I don't know what you call it when you're working for the electric. I mean, company. it's like a bucket truck, right? Yeah, he's, 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 he's up in the bucket truck. So he's getting like some sort of extra hazard insurance stunt work kind of pay. Like True. This this guy got paid pretty well for for this day's worth of work. Yeah, he got, is my, he got is his my guess 300 bucks for sure. That got him health insurance. Well, that's the guild at work. Yeah. I'm, I think he... I'm just happy for him. Well, I think he, he earned it too. Like he did a great job. And I think we are getting ahead of ourselves a bit because he hasn't delivered that line yet. But I think he does a great job delivering that line. We'll talk about it when we get there. Real quick on the 5,000 volts, though. I'd say your average theater-going adult in the 90s knows what a 9-volt battery is. Yeah. So even though 5,000 volts feels a bit arbitrary doesn't it also feel like quite a bit more than nine volts such that you go yeah that's pretty high voltage i think (laughs) i like throwing these questions into google because it's just a bunch of other dummies like me who (laughs) don't know how to ask it so like all the you know the extra questions are like can 5000 volts hurt you how bad is 6000 volts what voltage is safe to touch? Just, just we're all so stupid. <laughs> yeah, it looks like 250 volts can kill you. Right, so, that's what uh, I'm saying. Like, t- tell me I'm wrong here. Like, is is that not apparent? I guess here, here, here's the analogy. Don't tell me how poisonous the snakes are. Just tell me that there are poisonous snakes around, and I'll be careful. Point taken. Five thousand volts. What do I do with that information? I'm at the top of a of a of an electrical pole, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that like it's dangerous up here. Wait, now I have to ask: Are you asking for you, or are you asking for him? I'm only ever worried about my own safety. Okay, because and have little regard for the life of others. <laughs> because he would benefit from knowing the voltage. You, as a viewer. <laughs> What's he gonna do? Oh, this one's five thousand. I'm gonna put my gloves on. Uh, I think it's, is he not treating all blown transformers the same way, regardless of what sticker, what fake stickers on the on the front? Now, see, this is where we get into sort of something different because I don't necessarily see that as just a caution sticker, but also a utilitarian sticker, in that it's telling him what tools and or parts for repair he might need to provide sure which is really good to have in large typeface if you're on the ground looking up hey there's my engineer something to think about after all that we get um we got our first bit of dialogue (laughs) there's there's a sort of half line and then one line so Chuckles, who just knocked over the statue, is coming up to meet his partner who's knocking on the door. And 
Because he needs help with knocking on the door. And he either says nothing or grumbles or something. He sort of makes a what's up noise. Yeah, some sort of prompt that prompts our guy to be like, I don't know. She said eight sharp. And that's that's all we get, right? We do get another cut to the side table, which is a different shot, actually. Back inside with uh, with Kate? Kate's hand that we don't. Yeah, Kate's hand shows up before this minute's over. Yes, yes. And maybe I would argue that it's worth talking about this episode and next because it's some of the greatest hand acting we have this side of the Adams Family movies. Are you saying that we do a dual minute episode? No, 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 no. I don't want to get into the next minute. I'm saying that there's some crossover here. We can at least talk about the first half of this hand acting now and get into the second half of the hand acting later. Yes. Okay. So the hand acting that happens here does actually feel a bit thingy because it is very like bouncy. Mm -hmm. It's the outstretched hand kind of feeling for something where you don't actually have to see the body it's attached to. You know that that body can't see anything it's just feeling for with the hand yeah so good we see we see a meme of the clock blinking 12 people I, I don't think gen z or later will have a sense for that but clocks blinking 12 is just going to be it's an indication that something has gone wrong I don't see it that way. I see it as a nod to laziness often. How so? I'm not saying in this specific shot. I'm saying like the meme of blinking 12 o'clock. What it means that like you, you're too lazy to set your clock. You're too lazy to figure out how to set the time on your, on your stove. Right. All the, all the VCRs that blink 12. Oh, okay. Yeah. And VCR specifically, that's a very outdated, uh, uh, visual um moment of your home like i guess what i'm yeah. saying is it's a very common sight gag for a very specific period of time <laughs> yeah yeah you're yeah you're right that's that's the era uh but this this is not used that way this is used very specifically for what you said something went wrong which is that their power went out at 437 not 347. I knew the digits added up, but uh, Sorry. I just had them in the wrong order there. Going to have to s- swap you out for uh, someone else next week. I have to the accept listeners, that. Yeah, it, the <laughs> listeners can never forgive you. I thought you were about to say the listeners will vote in who is going to be your replacement. <laughs> Go ahead and write in to us. Um I don't know the email address. I forgot it because I've completely shoved everything about this podcast out of my brain now that I am no longer employed here. Yeah, this is a uh, yeah, this is your two week notice, right? <laughs> but, so I've got um, two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, so uh, that's so we get the home alone minute at gmail dot com. The home alone minute at gmail dot com. So we get hand fumbling around and then about to pick up a watch. Yes. And do we leave it there? I don't want to steal from the next minute. So that's I, th- I think that's where the where the cutoff is. I'm always kind of eyeballing it. Disney Plus makes it kind of tough to see the time code as you're watching it. So minute 15 thanks you. That is minute 14. And I know we just briefly mentioned the email, which I've now since remembered, is the home alone minute at gmail.com. Yeah, and I believe on uh, previous episodes, we were desperately begging for anyone to write us in and say anything. <laughs> Look, I, I don't I don't know if I would have said that. I would say that we were uh, pleading. Yeah, we I was I mean, personally, it's pretty thirsty for an email. You can claim or not claim any level of uh, desire. Oh, no, it, it reeked of desperation. 
Yeah. Filthy um, I made, rotten. I made some promises and some threats that I'm not proud of. And I appreciate everyone respecting my journey as I listen and grow from this experience. But Jared, I will say that our thirsty, desperate, mm, pathetic. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, yeah, pathetic. That's where we're that's where we're at. Uh, attempts to get an get someone to write us an email. Jared, they paid off. Ooh, ooh. Well, luckily, no one was recording while you were making all those promises. <laughs> Actually, we were recording and I left all of those in. So, Nick, thank you for the kind words. Jared, I don't want to read the whole email. That that um Nick wrote this in uh he, he in a drunken say, stupor? I well, maybe, but I he didn't put at the end like, "Hey, feel free to share this." So it's, uh, I don't know. I will. I, I no, think, no, I think no. I'm safe I, to paraphrase. I'm, though I am with you in that I have no desire to betray Nick's trust. Nick praises the show. He's having a good time. Nick, now we see love now too. now that you're not reading the email, it kind of sounds like. <laughs> No, no, no. It's in there. You're like, Trust no, me. he definitely enjoyed it. Trust it wasn't me. a He's scathing a, critique. A good time. He said nothing about the sound of my voice, the quality of my editing, the quality of our sound engineering, um, our garbage takes on his favorite movie. He cannot pick up on our stench somehow through the podcast. No, no, didn't mention that at all. <laughs> he did say that all the all the things that we promised people sounded a little like uh, a desperate Kate McAllister trying to uh, bribe people to give away their plane, give their plane ticket to her. Please. <laughs> uh, we offered some some da- some dangly earrings of her own <laughs> from a podcaster <laughs> to a podcaster. <laughs> Oh, Ed. And he did bring up a question that I think needs to get covered on here because we've gone we've gone through the whole night. Did Fuller with the bed? Absolutely. One hundred percent confidence. That's my level. Yeah. Where did he sleep? Possibly on the hide bed if it's not the bed in the attic. A different hide bed? We'll put him somewhere else was was what we heard last time, right? And we know that that's true, but we don't know where somewhere else is. You know where I put Fuller? If I'm if 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 I'm if I if I'm making the call outside, no. Uh, sleeping bag in the bathtub, 